Hey, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Outstanding. My name is Steve Wexler. Welcome to The Secret to Getting People to Use Dashboards. Oh, now you can really hear me. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am the founder and principal and sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was back in 1957. I'm a, a five-time Tableau Zen master. Um, those of you in Tableau, in the community, know that's an actual thing. Um, if you are not in the community, and I were to hand you a card, and it says Tableau Zen Master, you look at this thing and go, God, this guy is a real jerk. Who puts Tableau Zen Master on his own card? It, it is a real thing, and we have several of them uh, in the audience at the moment. Uh, hopefully cheering me on. Um, I am certainly proud of having been a Tableau Iron Viz champion, Tableau Zen master, but the thing I'm most proud of in the Tableau, excuse me, in the data visualization world is being one of the three authors of the big book of dashboards, along with, I guess, fellow jerk um, Jeffrey Schaefer. Now you're going to say, hey, he called you a jerk on stage. No, he's a fellow Zen master, Jeffrey Schaefer, and Andy Cotgreave, the chief technical evangelist at Tableau. Uh, speaking of Andy Cotgreave, this is um, his bookshelf in his home. Those are his author copies of the big book of dashboards. And the book is an attempt to distill or now combine 40 years experience in data visualization into one book. And I'm going to take one of the facets that we discuss in the book and try to discuss it here. Uh, for the most part, the review of the book have been very strong. You look on Amazon, it's in its third printing. There have been some notable exceptions, however. This comes from Andy's daughter. This is my dad's book, and I think it's really boring because it's about dashboards. And um, in all fairness, Andy's daughter, I think 10 or 11 at the time, was not the target market for the book. Um, how many of you have worked on products or services, and you have an idea of how People are going to use that product or service, and then they start, you start seeing things that you had never imagined. You know, any of you, raise your hand if you've seen that. Hey, we had this idea, and then the use cases went far beyond what we had in mind before. Anyone have that experience at all? Okay. Um, we certainly had that with the book. We had an idea about how people would be using this book in business, and then people would start tweeting and sending us examples of ways they used the book that we had never envisioned, this being one of my favorites. I'm going to give you an overarching guide to everything I've learned in data visualization. I got some of this from Jeff, some of it from Andy, and some of it from my own experience. But I'm going to show you four slides I will show them in every workshop I do. I'll show them several times. This will help probably guide you on the right path. But important, who is your audience? What's the message? And then this single sentence that now distills my 13 years of using Tableau and data visualization. For the largest number of people, provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. Largest number of people provide the greatest degree of understanding. Obviously, the least amount of effort isn't you. You have to work your asses off. It's for your audience. Make it easy for them to understand what's going on. Question, how many of you run into this? I don't need, with your, your, the people that you're supporting, I don't need charts, just show me the numbers, OK? Uh, the, the, let me show the embodiment of every client that has ever expressed that to me. That would be this guy. And you can have my spreadsheet when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. Okay? We're going to leave the how do we get people off of just numbers to charts for another time. But how about this one? Your dashboard has too many bar charts, and bar charts are boring. Anyone have that? How about, do, do, first of all, anyone have clients or stakeholders or colleagues who feel bar charts are boring or you have too many bar charts that's boring? How many also feel that themselves? That's OK, you know, that bar charts are boring. I'm going to show you how to make bar charts fascinating. Um, let me discuss why it is that you see so many bar charts. Um, here are three different ways to render the numbers 75 and 37. OK, look at the bars. Can you tell that bar B is twice as big as bar A? Pretty easily, correct? 
In fact, some of you, your OCD is so well-tuned, you can go, you know, bar B looks to be ever so slightly more than twice as big. Like, bravo if you can do that. Look at the middle circles that are there. Uh, you are all steeped in data visualization and thinking about these things. Most people look at B and don't think it's twice as big as A. They think it's like 50% more. I don't know anyone on the planet, by the way, who can look at these things here and go, oh, that blue is twice as blue as this other blue. Right? If you can do that, you're, you're, you're a savant. Now, that doesn't mean don't use circles. It doesn't mean don't use color. It just means for exact, easy-to-make comparisons, length from a common baseline or position from a common baseline, people are really good at it, really good at it. And you want to leverage those things. Just to kind of hone this in a little bit more, um, if you were to ask the average person what percentage of the big circle does the small circle take up? And you're all thinking about, I'm looking at this right now, I know what the answer is. And it's, and it's fighting every instinct. Most people would say, I don't know, it's taking up 75%, 80%, it's taking up half. That's the problem with using circles for exact comparisons. So just keep this in mind, circles are great, they're beautiful, they're exciting, they're terrible for exact comparisons. All right, so you told me that, hey, people just want to see the numbers. You've also indicated, a lot of you, that I'm getting pushback because people say my bar charts are boring. How about this one? Why aren't people using my dashboards? Anyone having that experience at all? Look, I've probably made more dashboards that people don't use than anyone I've ever met. And I would think, why aren't people using these dashboards? They're really helpful. And I would feel this enormous design pressure that would be on me, which is, oh, what am I going to do to really attract them to this and make it exciting and interesting? And I'm not a great designer. And, and so I would think, you know, how do I make the data more interesting? That's a really bad question to be asking. If you're asking that question, it's probably going to lead you down a bad path. Let me show you a quote from uh, Edward Tufte and then an interesting little anecdote about Mr. Tufte. I really like this. If your numbers are boring, get some interesting numbers. If you get some interesting numbers, you may learn something interesting. And I remember seeing this and going, oh, that kind of hones into some of the things that I've been thinking about and presenting. So I saw this on Twitter. I don't know, you know, July 2017, something like that. In August, I said, I got to find that quote from Edward Tufte. Do you all know who he is, by the way? He wrote The Visual Display of Quantitative Data, one of the seminal works in data visualization. Famous professor, and he's written in uh, four books, but that first one is really killer. So I'm now looking for the quote on Twitter. I can't find it. And I can't find it because I discovered he's banned me from following him on Twitter. And I've never felt so proud because the people he's banned from following him in, on Twitter, uh, who, who has been banned from Edward uh, following Tufty here? It's not, no longer an exclusive club. Alberto Cairo, Robert Kosara, Andy Cotgreep. There are a bunch of badasses in data visualization. And I'm thinking, what did I do you know, so that he doesn't want me following him? And, and I realized five years ago, I wrote a, a, a blog post, Sparkline Schmarkline. And, and, and he's a, th this believer in using these the small EKG-like visualizations. And I think spark lines are great. I just felt they were being overused. And for whatever reason, he said, oh, sorry, you did not appropriately show the appropriate amount of respect for me, Lord Edward Tufte. You may not follow me any longer. All right. I want to discuss a really bad data visualization challenge because it fits into the, oh, what am I going to do to get people engaged and interested in the data? Now, this is not like a Makeover Monday challenge, which I think are great, and it's a project that I think you should really, if you're not involved with, you should consider. This comes from someone that I think should know better. This is the annual, this is the balance sheet that you would find in the annual report of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this person was looking at the, the annual report of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the world trying to eradicate um, horrible diseases worldwide, malaria being one of them. And this person was thinking, 
you know, what do I need to do to get this people more engaged with this data? Now, I want you to look at some numbers that are in here for a minute, okay? That's a big number. That's not 43 million. That's $43 billion. That's up from 40 billion the previous year. Look at this other number, uh, 688. That's for uh, property and equipment assets. That's 688 million. Oh, it's down a little bit from the previous year. So do you have an idea of the scale of the numbers? You've got 43 billion. You've got 688 million, 692 million. And this person said, you know, what am I gonna do to get people more engaged with this data? Because this data is kind of boring. So this person did this. And I think this is a crime against data visualization. Okay, let me try to explain why. Look at the numbers that are here. You have this um, 692 million, and it's, oh my God, look at that downward slope. It, 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 what a decrease from 2013 to 2014. It's gone from 692 all the way down to 688. That's flat, but look at the incline of this. Then look at the height of where this thing starts. It's at 692, and look what you're comparing it with, 43 billion. You are asking people to fight something they do really well. We are really good at comparing heights from a common baseline. And this person is saying, ignore all that, be amused by the shapes, and just look at the numbers. So my reaction to this is, now it reminds me of some of the stuff that we have seen from Fox News. Okay? This, this one got a ton of play. Okay? And, and you, now, if you don't look at the numbers, the bar on the right looks like it's three times as big as the bar on the left, but it's not. It's, 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 it's only one-sixth as, uh, um, as big, at most. Here, here's another example, at least here. You know, it, by the way, a criminal offense here. They're not showing where the axis is starting. It's starting at about 5.5 million. Here, at least, they're showing you over on the right, it's starting at 34. But it looks like, oh my gosh, if Bush tax expire, they're gonna increase by five or six fold. Uh, Randy Crum, who's written a wonderful book called Cool Infographics, has said, here's a more accurate representation uh, of the chart. In case you think, hey, this guy is picking on Fox News, which tends to be a very right-leaning uh, broadcast medium, in the United States, um, Jeff was able to find this example from NBC. I'll just let you take that in for a minute. Here's, here's what it should be. In, in the case of, of the, the, this example here, I think this was just somebody messed up. In the case of the Fox News, it strikes me as being intentionally misleading. In any case, the Bill and Melinda Gates example the Fox News examples, all these things are an example of uh, what somebody has coined. I believe the person who first came up with this is Christopher Danielson. I need to find out. These are what are called turds. And what is a turd? A truly unfortunate representation of data. This is the difference between the US crowd and the, and the European crowd. You're very polite. This gets, you know, I can just go, look, a mouse in the United States. People go nuts. <laughs> the, the other aspect of this that I find, so there's our uh, brilliant acronym. The other aspect that I find disturbing about the whole Bill and Melinda Gates example was why are you even bothering to visualize that? There's so much important stuff that they're doing, meaningful stuff. Why do I want someone going, don't pay attention to the important stuff we're doing. I want you to look at the balance sheet. Why? That's distracting from the more important things that are in there. So let me give you a kind of a real world example. I had been working with a major worldwide consulting firm and they were doing a, a survey of over 3,000 people worldwide about best practices in human resources. And one of the dashboards that they had put together was a demographics dashboard. It simply was about who took the survey. 
nothing more. And a much more complicated version than this. This is a simplified version that has gender, it's got generation, it's got location, et cetera. So they'd have education level, industry, things like that. When they updated it the following year, they thought, this is really boring. So they created something that looks like this. And without a doubt, this is way more visually arresting, but you're really going to turn people off with this. Let's discuss what this thing you know, is. Well, first of all, we have this Mondrian-like creation up here. Wow, that's very colorful. And then, ooh, we've got circles. People love circles over here. I don't know what's up with this smaller group, the traditionalists, but they're red. They must be really angry about something. And then we can clearly see that we have more men than women who took the survey because there's a number that says 52 over here versus 48. And, and this is an example, by the way, of something in the book that we would call, thank you, if you were nodding off. That's much better on the second day in the afternoon when you're nodding off. A screaming cat. This is something that you shouldn't be doing. Without a doubt, it's colorful, and people are going to look at it and go, hey, what's going on here? But the other dashboard takes 10 seconds to parse. This is going to take about two minutes, and then you're going to realize, so what? Why do I even care about these things? You haven't done anything that makes this meaningful to me. And so you're going to lose interest because you haven't given some, you've asked people to take a long time to look at your colorful thing. And I have nothing wrong. You can do both, by the way. We have Neil Richards and some other people here who are capable of making stunning working things that have analytic integrity uh, in them as well. Uh, this does not have analytic integrity in it. And you're going to lose them because you haven't given them anything useful. So you might have attracted them usefully. So it's not the dashboard. It's the data that's boring. But wait a second. I said this thing about not searching for, you know, oh, my data is boring. How am I going to make it interesting? It's not the data. It's the context of the data. How do news organizations try to make stories interesting besides sensationalism? I'm going to bring up a kind of a, a, a somber notion, which is when you hear about an airplane crash, um, the, the 737 Maxes or something like that, first thing you hear about there was an airplane crash. The second thing is you hear how many fatalities. What's the next thing when you're, you know, either you're reading it in the paper or you're watching it on the news? Airplane crash, fatalities. What's the next thing that's going to be coming out of the commentator's mouth? Anyone want to volunteer? How many what? No, they told you, okay, it, it happened in Ethiopia, it happened in uh, uh, Guatemala, wherever it is. You know what? It's too hard. In, with a group of 20, I can pull this off. This group, not so much. The next thing is, how many of my country people were on board? If I'm in the United States, they're going to tell me, here's how many Americans were on board. And I was thinking, is it Americans that are just horribly narcissistic? No, it's every group. You know, the, I've, I've, I've looked at in, in how many French were on board, if you're reading this in Le Mans, how many Australians were on board. And so why are they doing that? What is it that interests people? And it's stuff about themselves. And I'm not saying, hey, you know, people are horribly narcissistic. You just have a hierarchy of how you look at these things. You know, I'm going to care more about my kids than I'm going to care about my neighbors, about my townspeople, about other people, and about people living halfway across the world. I can't bleed or have an equal interest in all things. So they're going to try to put, you know, focus this on me so somehow I can identify with it. Uh, by the way, if anyone knows who this is who's not from the United States, I would be gobsmacked. Anyone know who this is? My wife knows who this is, but she's definitely from the United States. Anyone know? Just a hand up? Wow. Okay. He, this was Ed Koch. He was the mayor of New York City for eight years, uh, 77 to 85, and he had a famous catchphrase. How am I doing? People want to know that. So how do you think about, hey, how am I going to appeal to the individual with this thing in in creating your dashboards. So instead of just presenting data, think how much older, younger am I than others? How is the store I manage compared with all others? How's 
our company doing in these respects compared to our 18 competitors? How did my session compare with others? How is my salary compared with others? How common is my birthday? How much will I save if I use a generic drug? And going back to that survey data thing, how do people like me respond to the survey? That makes the demographic dashboard useful to the person. And they'll go, oh, this could be really helpful. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, by the way, I don't know if, if this is happening in Europe and other countries at all, but it's starting to be really popular in the United States with utility companies trying to get people to save. And rather than saying, you know, you could be saving this much money if you got your act together and insulated or do other things like that, they're starting to do things like this, which is, here's you, here are all your neighbors, and here are the cool neighbors you want to be like. You want to be like the green people. You're not doing as well as the green people. And they're trying to say, hey, what do I need to do a little bit better? Are, you, are your utility, anyone have utility bills like this? Cool. By the way, these graphs aren't, aren't, aren't that bad. That, that look, you know, the blue line is you and it's a little bit thicker, so hats off to the utility company. Most utility companies, their visualizations are god awful. So let, let me show you how you can take data that without context may seem boring, but if you make it about the individual, it becomes fascinating. This is demographic data for the United States. My apologies for making this US-centric. I got the idea from this fellow, Chad Skelton. He did a similar visualization about uh, data in Canada. You could do it in any country. And it is the demographics or the uh, histogram showing the age distribution of people in the United States. And the the way to read this, if you're troubled by it, is you've got, oh, I don't know how many, uh, you know, just under you know, f uh, 4 million newborns, and you're kind of peaking here around 25. Now, for most of my friends and colleagues, they kind of go, boy, that's kind of boring. If you're a data geek, you probably want to know what happened here. And again, you know, I'm going to, this is too large a group to say, oh, you know, what happened over there? You're noticing something happening between around the age 65, 66. And originally, I thought, oh, in the United States, traditionally, retirement age is 65. People are reaching 65, and they're dying. <laughs> and, and, which is good. And, and I can understand that. People lose a sense of purpose and things like that. that. That might be the case. Someone else pointed out and said, well, wait a second. This is data from 2014. And a much more credible explanation um, is it's, it's baby boomers. Those are people who were born. Everything to the left are people born at, from 1946 and on. And that's when there was the, um, a huge increase in the population in the United States. Well, in any case, I find this interesting. My stakeholders probably not so much. How can I get them to understand the data and have it meaningful to them? And I got inspired by Chad Skelton to create this interactive dashboard. So I'm going to drop out for a second. And hopefully this will cooperate. And I'm going to ask somebody. Let's see if we, this refreshes. Oh, this is where I was going to give the shout out to Chris Love. Chris, there are some improvements. I made this dashboard three, four years ago. There are a number of improvements I, I need to make to it. I'm wondering if you could make them in real time now and have the new dashboard ready when, when the session is done. By the way, he doesn't have his laptop there. He could do it. Um, so here's the way to read this thing. If you are, let's say, you're in the United States, and I'm going to assume the European it's going to be different, but not wildly different. So if you are 40 years of age, you are older than 53% of all Americans. I've got to tell you, if you are 50 or older, this thing is depressing. Okay, I need, um, do I have a volunteer? Give me your age and gender, and I'll plug the thing in. I'll say, if you were living in the United States, here's how much older or younger you would be than the other people who are there. Do anyone want to volunteer their age and gender? Go, what? 36, I'm not going to feel terribly sorry for you. So if you were living in the United States, and this data is a little bit old, 36, and you're a man, as far as I can tell from up here, you would be older than 49.7% of the rest of the country. Anybody else want to volunteer? 
20, 28. All right. She whiz. Sounded like a woman. That on that side, not on this side. Um, you would be older than 35.9%. Um, here are the improvements. Um, one is, this is a great use case for parameter actions. Instead of dragging this thing, I could just click a bar. And the other thing is, this is actually a good use of a pie chart. You can see, you know, um, two, three slices, the number of people who are older than you, the number of people, percentage of people older, percentage of people that are younger, you can see, oh, it's a rare case, but it's a good use of a pie chart. I'm going to take one for the team right now, put my own age in. You are supposed to pretend to be utterly astonished that I'm this old. So when I drag the slider and just let out a gasp and go, oh, hold on, not yet. Thank you. You're good. Okay, there's, there's hope for the European audiences here. Um, I am older than 81.8% of people, of men living in the United States, um, which kind of bums me out. I think it bums my wife out as well. Um, the only solace I got from this is my brother is five years older than I am. And he's lorded that over me for years. And so I go, hey, Rick. Um, I also have an odd kind of you know day-to-day -day, uh, type of, of uh, living, where I go to the gym, I work out, and then I then have breakfast with what would be my parents' generation. I work out of the house most often, and one of them said, "Hey, put my age in here," and I said, "You really don't want me to do this." He said, "No, no, no, go ahead, put it in." He was 83 at the time, and he saw he was older than 98 percent of the country and it really bummed him out. So, but notice the difference between this and the other example that we had, which is now you give this to your stakeholder, the person, they're gonna wanna go, hey, how am I doing? Uh, th th they're gonna use this, they're gonna put their partner's age in, they're gonna put their parents' age in, they're gonna put their kids' age in, and now the data has become meaningful to them. I'm gonna sh show you some other examples of this used really effectively. Here's something from Curtis Harris. Um, he does great work. If you're not following him, you should. He stole one of the dashboards from the big book of dashboards, and it's showing here is Curtis as a professor, the blue dot, compared with other people in his department, the darker gray dot compared with the college as a whole. And it doesn't surprise me that, that Curtis um, is doing way better than other people on average because he does I've never seen him present, but I've seen his work and how he explains it, and he's magnificent. This, these are speaker ratings from the 2015 Tableau conference, and it's allowing an individual to see, here's how you did versus the average of everybody else. And this speaker, don't know who it is, um, would think, hey, I'm doing really, look at me, you know, my dot is above all the other bars. Well, if you can get it, I'm a huge fan of disaggregated data. I want to show you exactly the same data, but it's now going to tell a slightly different story. All those dots are different speakers that present it. The higher the dot, the higher the rating. And now we can see, oh, okay, our whomever this speaker is, you know, he or she types in the ID and can see, all right, you know, what percentile am I in? And that 4.2 all the way on the right, which, you know, seemed to be so great, I can see, oh, you know, I'm, I'm above the median, but not by that much. So here's a possible way to show it. Another way to do this would be uh, a unit histogram, as here's you versus everybody else. And it allows somebody to get a real sense of where they are in the universe. Um, I just want to hark on that disaggregated data for a second. Here's a salary comparison dashboard or visualization that I put together. And it would allow an individual to say, here's your salary versus the average of other people. And the reason the orange dot is where it is is because this person is um, uh, Generation X. Let's say you were doing this. You know, you're, you're looking at this thing, you're making about $80,000. How pissed off are you at this point that you're making this much money versus everybody else? It's kind of a rhetorical question. You're going, well, 
Yeah, it's lower, but it doesn't look that much lower. Well, let me change the visualization and go with the disaggregated data, exactly same data. Now how pissed off are you compared to all your kites? Whoa, wait a second. It's exactly the same data, but you're now seeing it in the context of everybody else. By the way, there, you know, um, I've now been hip to other ways of doing this. I've been a huge fan of what, what is called the jitter plot. If you're wondering what's the difference between a dot to the left and a dot to the right within a column, nothing. You're, all you're doing is, instead of just putting them all in one strip, you're just jittering them left and right. If you don't know how to do that type, how to jitter in Tableau, you'll get 15 different blog posts and knowledge base articles on how to do it. It's not difficult. Um, a guy from Romania, Daniel Zvinka, kind of hit me and said he kind of likes this view of it. He's done something even more advanced. It allows you to see the distribution of things a little more easily. I want to explain why I'm so high on the jitter plot, this idea of showing here's you versus everybody else, and if you're doing badly, here's how you can improve. I was working with a major medical um, institution or organization that had healthcare data on thousands of different companies, and they were trying to get people to realize you have a problem in your organization. So they would come armed with this. The incidence of diabetes in your organization is 18.5%, but the average of all other organizations like yours is 4.9. That's, that's terrible. It didn't, it didn't have the reaction it wanted it to. I'm not saying this is the greatest visualization, but when they saw this, it had an almost visceral effect. Here's your dot. Look where all the other dots are clustering, way down here. You are an unenviable outlier up here. If they could finally see here's where they are in the universe and realize, oh my gosh, we have one of the worst performing companies with respect to compliance about diabetes. What are we going to do to improve it? Let me show you some other examples. This is a data visualization from Andy Kriebel. I think it's from seven years ago. I'm sure there are other things he would do now, but it's really um, quite good. And um, to my knowledge, this is the first Tableau public visualization that went viral. Why did it go viral? It's showing the popularity of birthdays in the United States. You know, that all 366 days you could be born, and he's got the month along the top, he's got the uh, day of the month along the side, and just looking at this, what looks like to be the month that has the most births in it? Yeah, September. A lot of births in September, you're all doing the math in your head and going, what does that mean if there are a lot of people born in September? Oh yeah, New Year's Eve, okay, now I get it. Um, the, but people would use it because they'd want to know their birthday. They'd want to know their spouse's or partner's birthday. They'd want to know their kid's birthday and how this would work. Curtis Harris, second time I'm mentioning him, I love this data visualization. He had masses amounts of data on U.S. housing data, and again, my apologies for being so U.S.-centric, but it had 40 or 50 years of data for, for 50 different states of how housing prices have waxed and waned. How do you make that something that's useful and meaningful to your stakeholder? Well, said, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, I live in California, I paid this much for the house, here's when I bought it, and you can see, oh, you know, you should feel pretty good. You bought it here, you bought it on the downturn. You were probably bummed out a little, you know, a few years in. But look, from when you bought it, the, the value of it is up 55%. So this, how can I insert my user into the thing or make it something that's about them? Hugely important. Which brings me to this book that uh, Kelly Martin, who I hope some of you I hope everyone here knows who she is. A Tableau Zen master for four years and really elevated um, uh, the uh, design aesthetic of Tableau dashboards. Before writing the big book of dashboards, she recommended that I read this. And you know, the key takeaway from the book, it wasn't my key takeaway, was people don't want to be badass at using your tool. They want to be badass at what using your tool allows them to do. Here's what I got from reading the book was how is what you're doing going to be helping your stakeholder, your audience, the person who's using it? You know, what is it that they want to see? What is it they want to know? How do you get into their head? And it started to inform everything that I do. Okay, let me show you a typical agenda slide. 
I hate these things. Someone, I'm giving, you know, you go to this workshop and then someone puts something like this up here, right? And says, okay, we're gonna do this or this. And I know they don't care about everything that's on there. This is what they care about. <laughs> and, it, and it really has started to inform everything I'm doing. How is what I'm gonna be doing help you? How do I make this about what is meaningful to you? So let's go back to the quote-unquote boring respondent demographic dashboard. It is boring. It's not terribly interesting data. Um, how many of you know who Elisa Fink is? Raise your hands. She was, until last November, the chief marketing officer at Tableau. Wonderful woman, very insightful, did a great job, and also knew how to use the tool, by the way. I saw some of the visualizations she made. 2014, there was the Iron Viz competition and uh, Jeffrey Schaefer was, was participating in it. In any case, it was about Yelp data. You know, um, uh, the popularity and ratings of different restaurants. And she said, you know, the problem that I've always had with Yelp data, and I had hoped that people using this data would have taken advantage of it, was I don't want to know what everybody thinks. I don't care what some 18-year-old guy thinks about the restaurant, because he may be impressed with the the size of the portions and not the quality. She wanted to have the ability to, I want to filter the results for people who may ha be looking for a similar restaurant experience to me. So how do we make this boring dashboard more useful? Well, we, we asked someone to say, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I'm a woman, I'm a baby boomer, I'm from South America. Oh, here's how we can use this dashboard. Let's triangulate on those people. And you can see there are 36 people who took this survey, and that's over this so-called magic number of 30 within survey data. 36 people with a similar background who took this survey. Would you like to see what they thought about all these things in human resources? Now, this thing has become very useful because I've said, I'm gonna filter it through your eyes. That said, if you do get pushback that you're using too many bars or something like that, my possible suggestion that will get you out of a bind, I have no problem with you using, uh, creating a lollipop chart. How, how many of you have seen a lollipop chart? I don't think I can give credit to Andy Cotgreave for coining the term because I think something uh, precedes him. The comet chart, I think he owns that one. Lollipop chart, I'm not sure. It plays into what people do well. It's position along a common baseline, but it has circles, and the circles look pretty, and people like it. So, so if you're getting pushed back on the bars, maybe you can see, get away with, putting some cir um, with using a lollipop chart. In any case, you know, the overarching things that I mentioned before, who is your audience, what is the message, and for the largest number of people, provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort, and if you're finding people aren't using your dashboards, for me, it was a huge relief when I realized I can't make these sumptuous, beautiful looking, uh, artistic things, things from Johnny Walker, et, et cetera, but I can figure out how can I insert my stakeholder, the person using this thing into the dashboard. They're very likely to use it, and if they're doing poorly, they're gonna to wanna to look at the dashboard week after week after week because they wanna see where their dot is and how it's moving up. Um, we'll take questions in a moment. Uh, if you liked the, this presentation, I hope you will fill out an evaluation and say that you like Steve Wexler. If not, just give an evaluation of Francois Agenstadt and uh, have, have him show up in there. And for more stuff, there's a lot of, um, 14 of the dashboards that are featured in the book, including some of these uh, uh, comparison dashboards um, uh, where you can show an individual versus others. They're available for download at bigbookofdashboards.com, and I have a lot of free stuff at datarevelations.com. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Do we have the, do people have microphones here going throughout the room, or is that like, oh, they forgot to bring mics? All right, if you have questions, I'm going to ask you to stand up and, and, and shout. Crickets. There we go. Thank you.
Well, okay, so the question is, you know, I have a you know, pretty long longitude in do, doing data visualization. You know, um, kind of got into it by accident, uh, and a lot of people have, but been doing this 13, 14 years or whatever, and is there something coming down the pike? We've got bar charts, line charts, lollipop charts. Apparently, everyone involved with data visualization, they want to invent a new chart type. You know, look, I created the bullet chart. Ah, I created the tree map or something like that. The, there may be something coming down the road. Now, most people think 3D is for the birds because it distorts things. You don't have three, um, 3D um, bar charts, 3D pie chart, et cetera. Who knows what's gonna happen when they perfect holographic technology and you can like walk inside the graph and stuff like that. So the other thing that blows me away is this notion of, hey, the, you know, just show me the numbers, the numbers are all I need. That's not new. You know, it, at, at, at your leisure, look up something called Anscombe's Quartet. This goes back to the early 70s, where uh, a statistician was trying to convince his colleagues, rigorous statistical analysis of the numbers is not enough. You actually have to see the data. And if you look at you know, books from 100 years ago, if you look at visualizations from William Playfair from 1786, he's just using line charts brilliantly. And I keep thinking, and maybe Chris, you think the same thing, which is, doesn't everybody know this by now? You know, and no, they don't. We don't know, you know it, it isn't so much, gee, we, we need this new data visualization type, and someone may come up with something, it's we don't know how to properly use the things that we have available to us, and that's why you're here, that's why I'm learning from, from all of you, and, and et cetera. Long-winded answer, but hopefully that, that helped a bit. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay, so, you know, charts that got really popular and people realize, oh, that's just stupid. You're going to see, look, to what degree do you, are you involved with following uh, people, uh, uh, tableauians and, and things like that on, on Twitter? And it, it, it's, it's actually pretty potent. Someone will come up with, like, uh, a chart and say, hey, I figured out how to do a sand key diagram in Tableau. And for a month or two, people go have sand keyitis and everyone's creating sand keys, and they're coming up with new ways to create sand keys. And then there were Mar Marimako charts and things like that. All these charts have their use cases. There's a good use case for a sand key. There's a rare but good case for a Marimako chart. Uh, there are rare but good cases for a chord diagram, but everyone sees the thing, they go, wow, that looks so cool. I want to make that thing, and then I want to try to find a place to use it in business, and that's usually where it's don't try to fit the chart to the use case, you know, fit the chart to the data. It's the data and the needs of your user that should be doing this. Um, look, you're gonna get, I remember someone at, at, you know, Tableau was giving a presentation and someone in the back of the room said, you know, I'm surprised you don't have advanced chart types like 3D pie charts. And, and, and I'm sure the Tableau person just wanted to bang his head against the wall and go, 3D pie, that was, that was a feature of, of Excel in 1990. It's a horrible way to present data, but someone thought, oh, that's still thinks that's a cool thing to do. Um, we are all here to try to convince you so you can convince your colleagues, you, everybody, that here's why this is a good way to present the data this way. It plays into what people do well, and this is why the 3D bi pie chart, it may look cool, isn't nearly as effective as this other way to present stuff. And we're, you know, the, the, I was expecting them to give me a lovely little clock up here, but they didn't. Um, one more, okay, I'll take two more questions and then we, we will adjourn, yes. Oh, which color, great question, and, and in, the, in another session, I will pay you to ask me that question. Um, the use of color and color ranges. Jeff Schaefer and I, he's one of the fellow, fellow author on the Big Book of Dashboards, are in complete agreement about this. And, and oh, I got to do this. We got we, this. Will be fun. Give me a minute. Hey, 
the overuse and misuse of color. Hey, we've got 17 different product subcategories. Let's use 17 different colors, okay? Hold on a sec. A lot of pressure here to go, where is that presentation? Where is it? Where did I put it? But it's worth it. I'm watching a guy open files, the most exciting part. By the way, this has the potential to be disastrous. Okay. I'm a big believer in colorblind friendly colors for a divergent palette, not using red and green because people suffer from um, red, uh, green color vision deficiency. But people tend to overuse categorical colors. And practically every dashboard in the book, big book of dashboards, just use two or three colors. Maybe one has four, and I wanna try to drive this home. So. I'm going to do a dividing point right here. I'm going to ask everybody, let's see, on this side to close your eyes. Please close your eyes. Everybody leave them open. And I'm going to ask you, what do you conclude from the following chart? Uh, people to my left, eyes closed, over here, OK? I'm going to give you five seconds to look at this chart, and you're going to tell me if you can come to a conclusion. Ready? One, two. Three, four, five. Okay, don't give me any conclusions yet. Hopefully something hit you. This side of the room, close your eyes. This side of the room, open your eyes. I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna give you five seconds to look at it and tell me if you reached any conclusions. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. First group over here, everybody open eyes. Boy, this has the potential to be either fantastic or a gross embarrassment, okay? This group over here, what conclusion did you reach? What did you see, if anything? S Saturday and Sunday are different from the rest, and how are they different? Lower, how many people saw that Saturday and Sunday were different and was lower? Keep your hand up. How many people here saw it? Okay, yes, that's what I wanted to see. Now, if you're wondering, wait a minute, are they really smart and we're really stupid? Let me show you what you both saw. Here, color, you're using color effectively to get people to, to see the thing you want them to see. Yes, it's curated a little bit. On the right, you are fighting color to find what's useful in this thing. Color isn't doing anything to help you understand the data. It's just distracting from it terribly. So my, again, long-winded answer to your very simple question is um, use color sparingly. Use it to highlight the thing that you think is important and mute everything else, and that will probably take you down uh, a wonderful path. Even though a lot of people are gonna go, yeah, but that one has so many colors and it looks so cool. Look how hard it is to uh, gain the attention. In any case, I don't want to keep people longer. I'm happy to entertain some questions up here. Do fill, uh, fill out the evaluation forms. I'll put my contact information back up. And thank you very much. It was a really fun session. And Chris, you updated the dashboard, right? <laughs>